and hand over to Sasha and Kirsten. Hello everyone, it's really, really nice to meet you. My name is Sasha and uh, this is Kirsten. We are the founders of Uncommon and Uncommon is a company looking to support the mental health uh, of neurodivergent teenagers. So we are absolutely uh, passionate and really, really excited about trying to make changes in neurodivergent teenagers lives and we're focusing initially uh, on autism. I am, um, I, I am, uh, I have ADHD so I'm neurodivergent myself. Um, I, my background is that I have uh, worked a lot with schools, um, I've been a theatre producer um, and I love creating products for people that really really work so I spend a lot of my time talking to autistic teenagers and uh, parents are trying to find out what's going on in their lives and then making sure that we're kind of creating products that work for them. Kirsten. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kirsten. I founded and come with Sasha. I'm autistic. Um, I have a background in technology and development, also in um, designing um, technology based products to support people with disabilities. And so this has been a passion of mine for a number of years. And obviously I've got a huge personal interest in terms of bringing great new services to autistic young people in particular. Um, I think both of us experienced uh, the ups and downs of being a neurodivergent teenager. And so we're just very glad um, that we are in a time where it's much more talked about in terms of the challenges that we face as neurodivergent people. And it's a great time to hopefully to really begin to change the narrative around this and bring some more practical help to you as parents of neurodiv neurodiverse families and to neurodivergent teens. Kirsten, um, your sound is, is quite a lot quieter than Sasha. I don't know if you're able to do anything about that. I probably can. Sasha, well, do you well, want to yeah. <laughs> While Kirsten's doing that, we'll tell you a little bit about what we're working on um, at Uncommon. So as Kirsten says, we are absolutely committed to um, changing the narrative around what it means to be neurodivergent. So we know that when uh, a diagnosis of autism or ADHD is given, often the narrative that's surrounding that um, that diagnosis is full of words like deficit and disorder and young people and adults are often told that there's going to be a series of things wrong with them, that they're going to struggle through life and whilst Kirsten and I both fundamentally accept that there are challenges with being neurodivergent. Actually, there are many brilliant things that can come with it as well. And Kirsten and I have uh, had ups and downs in both of our lives and have both accomplished really exciting things and also had challenges as well. But what we know is important and what our research has told us is that if there are adjustments made and if, if young people who are neurodivergent are given the right type of support, then actually they are often capable of achieving extraordinary things and we are very we are frankly bored of the narrative that constantly talks about why that why things are going to be wrong and why 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 this is this, and, and bored of the kind of constant negative narrative and that's what we want to do is we want to fund what it means to be um to be neurodiverse and as i said before we are starting uh our first project to be working with teenagers who are autistic uh kirsten how's your sound doing I think my sound is yeah, much, better. Better. much better. Okay, fabulous. Um, so, very quickly, I'm going to share screen for a bit, but we're going to try and make sure that this is nice and interactive. Um, just briefly, in terms of what we'll talk through this evening, uh, we're going to talk a bit about why transitions are hard in particular for young autistic people. We'll talk about how we can build confidence pre transition how we can think about our relationships um, pre-transition and then think about how some skills that we can use kind of during transition to kind of make this process um, a much more positive one or as positive as it can be. So um, at Uncommon, um, we sort of build everything that we do off our thriving autistic framework. So this is built off a lot of research um, on what works for autistic people and what has helped um, autistic adults who are now thriving in life, what has helped them reach the place that they have 
um, have come to. And there are six things that we found um, really makes the difference. Um, and if we go around the circle, I think some of these may sound really obvious. And some of them may also sound as though they're things that you can't necessarily do, do things about. But I think we'll talk about how actually these are all things that you can really support as, as parents. And these are things that really will help support your young person. So um, the first thing that was shown to kind of help um, autistic adults thrive was that they engaged in their passions. Now, we've many of us have weird and wonderful passions. I know I definitely do. Sometimes those change, some of them stay for life. I've got a lifelong interest in uh, hard infrastructure, which may not be to everyone's tastes, but um, for a period of 10 years, that was a core part of my career. And it really did um, help me that that had been a passion throughout my life. It had been supported by people around me and um, it became you know, a part of what helped me succeed. Um, the second is that you've had your strengths empowered. Um, again, it may sound like a sort of obvious thing, but I think sometimes with autism, our strengths are either not obvious or they're different, or they are maybe sort of hidden under layers of other things. So um, part of what we'll um, think about during this is how can we think about strengths and how can we really empower those? Um, thirdly, there's a lot of evidence that basically says if autistic people experience social acceptance, then um, they experience much greater mental well-being and much smoother path through life. Um, and whilst that may not sound like something that you can engineer, actually, I think we all know that there are spaces in which we feel more socially accepted and comfortable than others. So actually, it's about finding those spaces and creating as many of those positive spaces as you can. Um, fourthly, um, positive self-esteem seems a really key factor, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, number five is around emotional stability, and we'll talk a little bit about thinking styles during this session. And then six is successful relationships. And again, that's something that we'll focus on today so but before we kind of jump in as we said we want to make this interactive Sasha do you want to um talk us through so, how we do this so we are using a bit of software here called Slido um now uh, Slido is a kind of interactive way of you being able to answer questions and then we can kind of show everybody the results of those questions it's sort of like a live poll really so if you've got your mobile phone with you you need to just point your phone at the screen and scan in that QR code and we'd like you to respond to the question, what has something your young person has done that's made you be really proud of? If you don't have your phone with you, you can just go into the website www.slido.com, which is down in the bottom left hand corner, and just type in that number. And that number should then take you straight to that poll. And what we want to do is just for you to answer the question, because we, this narrative that we've talked about that is often around uh, a very negative narrative. Uh, we want to start this off with a celebration. So we'd like as many of you to join us in celebrating what some of your young people have done or have achieved that you've been really proud of. Um, if any of you are struggling with using Slido, don't worry, you can pop your answers in the question, um, in the uh, comment section in the, uh, in the in the chat here and we will uh, we will look at those as well. So we've got a few coming in, as you can see. Um, so we've got a few here. Oh, wonderful. Found her voice. That's amazing. Identity in terms of autism is so important. That's wonderful that that's happened. Attempting her maths GCSE. Brilliant. We know that exams in the research that we've done is really stressful for people. So that's great that that's happening. Participating in a theatre group. Yes, fantastic. Well, I was a theatre producer for many years, so I'm very excited to hear that. Self-advocacy -ad after being recently diagnosed as autistic, brilliant. Certainly um, being able to advocate for yourself is such an important part of having a thriving autistic life. Taught herself crochet at nine and spelt the whole lockdown perfecting this until she could be, oh my gosh, that's adorable. Making crochet animals, oh my goodness, that sounds, that sounds wonderful. Um, and this week, communicating, able to tell me some of her struggles at school. That's fabulous. So there are some amazing things there and that's really great. I just think it's both Kirsten and I just think it's really, really important that in everything that we do, we are celebrating the young person at the heart of it. That's what we want to do. And we want to help young people to have the types of lives where all of these things that we're celebrating now can be 
can be possible um and voted as house captain there we go there's a last a brilliant one the last extra one to pop in there so as you can see from slido that's how slido works so just so you have probably picked up we everybody will be able to see your answers but nobody can see who the answers come from so when you are typing in answers as we're going to be doing throughout the whole of this uh, this presentation just put in stuff that you're comfortable with or if you want to say something that um, maybe feels makes you feel a little bit vulnerable and you still want to communicate it it's fine nobody's going to know where that that's come from you so there we go all right let's move on to the uh, next section Kirsten Kirsten you're on mute Sorry. Just so we know who's in the room, it'd be great to, on Slido, um, don't worry, we won't always be on Slido, um, just to know what transition is your young person soon to go through. Cool. So we've got people going from high school to college. I changed schools between, yeah, a bit, a bit of high school and sixth form and really, really enjoyed that transition. Um, primary, secondary, going to university, amazing. Changes at home. I mean, I think it, it's important to recognise, isn't it, that some some transitions are these sort of life stages. Others things will happen to life. We we move, we go in and out of school as young autistic people potentially. So these are all um, transitions that we can help support proactively. Fantastic. Um, we've got a general high high school to college trend in there. Fabulous. <laughs> so feel free to um, keep on going with Slido, by the way. <clears throat> um, your answers will kind of continue to come uh, come through and they're also really helpful to us because they also help us kind of make sure that we are um, continuing to evolve and improve the work that we do here. Um, now, just, we're going to come out of Slido for a little bit. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to start to talk a bit about... Um, about why we might find um, transitions a little bit difficult. So, so I'm just going to quickly interrupt Kirsten because someone's asked what the Slido number is. Um, and just for anybody who wants to know, it's 959921. Okay. Thank you. 999521. Okay. And we can potentially just pop that in the Zoom chat as well. So, there we are, so Kathy, speaking us to it. There we go. Yeah, amazing. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, we as autistic people might find transitions a bit challenging. So they're particularly challenging for us because uh, for, for three reasons. So first of all, we have low uncertainty tolerance, and we'll talk a bit about what that means in a moment. Um, secondly, um, transitions does mean that we need to potentially form new relationships. And given that that's something that at times can be more challenging for us, this is obviously a point of potential stress or potential amazing opportunity. Um, and finally, we are more susceptible to various mental health challenges and change does mean uncertainty, hence we don't know what might happen. And so that can be another reason why transitions are challenging. So first of all, uncertainty tolerance. So what is this? So uncertainty tolerance is our ability to manage uncertainty to manage change and for autistic people because our brains tend to look at the world in an extreme amount of detail um, when we go into new situations our brains are working really really hard to understand the new structures systems rules spaces people that we meet and when we've been in predictable environments that we know we kind of develop a whole series of be it routines or rules for ourselves that are easy, we kind of understand, we get to grips with them. Generally they work, sometimes they don't, but generally they do. And when we're in new uncertain situations, um, we don't have those kind of rules and structures to rely on. And we're just trying to process a lot of information. Um, now that ability to process information is what helps us grasp really complex ideas at school or at work, or you know, often means that we're very creative. Um, so this is a fantastic thing that our brains do, but unfortunately it can make new situations quite tricky because the sheer volume of information and kind of infinite potential uh, scenarios or situations that we face mean that we can feel overwhelmed. Um, we may always also have sensory hypersensitivities, which can mean that we're processing a lot of inputs. 
Um, we don't know what the new environments are going to be like, and they can be quite uncomfortable for us. Um, and finally, we do at times find it really hard to both understand our thoughts and feelings and to communicate those to others, even in known understood situations. So when we're in really new situations, there are times when we can feel a growing level of stress and discomfort, but we aren't able to communicate with that with people and hence find ways to kind of work through it. So this is some of the reasons why um, our tolerance or ability to kind of navigate uncertainty is at times lower than other people's. Um, but good news is the session is going to go through some tools and techniques that we can use um, to help manage this. Um, so secondly, new relationships. So as autistic people, we tend to form relationships a little bit differently to neurotypical people or even other neurodivergent people. Uh, we find small talk difficult or just at times really pointless. I think Sasha's probably seen that bored look on my face occasionally in the middle of chit chat. So um, traditional way of just kind of hanging out with people and engaging like in meandering chats may not work for us. And um, so instead we thrive when we make friends in more structured contexts around an activity or a point of interest. And whilst making new friends might feel challenging, actually the good news is as we kind of go through some of these transitions, as we grow up and kind of reach new environments, there are actually more opportunities to join special interest groups. So the number of kind of clubs and societies and things that you find as you kind of get into college, you try new subjects, maybe you get into university, you try new societies and this sort of thing, um, is actually, there's a lot of opportunities to basically go and find your tribe. Um, we are also either often hyper or hypo empathic. So either we may find it difficult to connect with people's emotions or we might be overwhelmed by the emotions of people around us and we can find it hard to interpret social situations. And one of the things that can happen, especially during transitions when we're quite overwhelmed is that our brains switch into much more kind of black and white thinking because we're just trying to figure situations out quite quickly. Um, but that can mean that at times we actually sort of misinterpret because we're just trying to very quickly make decisions and think things through. And we can, we'll talk a bit about what that means later on. Um, in any case though, moving to a new setting um, whilst developing new relationships might be challenging, it's an opportunity to develop exciting new friendships. And we've had lots of lovely stories um, from people we've worked with talking about uh, their young person changing the environment and really kind of managing to make a leap or a change in how they navigate friendships has been really positive. So it can be incredibly exciting. Um, and finally, so, as autistic people, we do tend to have a slightly higher base level of stress. Um, and this is because of our sensory sensitivities, our social sensitivities. Um, but because we've generally had a sort of higher base level of stress for a prolonged time, it also means that we react much more quickly to sources of stress and anxiety than other people might do. Um, this does mean that kind of during transitions, it's very important to as well as we can kind of manage that stress and anxiety just because it's more likely to kind of spike quickly um, but in this session again we'll talk you through some of the things we can kind of put in place to help and avoid um, and then manage those challenges so we can do a couple of quick um, data points again and Apologies if this is slightly back and forth, but um, <laughs> the joys and the wonders of technology. Um, so it'd be good to kind of understand in the room what challenges about transitions are most worrying you. So coming out high up there is finding social situations and groups overwhelming. Um, the stress and worry about uncertainty itself, um, making meaningful new friendships, potential challenges around mental health. Um, the ability to plan and act more independently. Um, and we can touch on this a bit and I'm happy to talk about this in Q&A Q &A as well. I, um, 
went through a number of different transitions as I've sort of hinted at. I changed schools in uh, sixth form. I took a year out before university, did one year of uni. It didn't quite go as well as I'd hoped. I did take another year out and restarted. So there are different ways to do transitions and I think they can be managed at different stages that work for the person involved. Um, so very happy to answer any questions about that as we go through. So, so really okay, worries about worsening mental health challenges really coming up top there. Um, so we're really happy to answer more questions about that in the Q&A, but hopefully also the things that we'll go through in the session um, will help think through some of that. And then just to kind of quick, in your own words, we'd love to sort of understand as a parent sort of what your greatest worry is for yourself. I mean, I think for any parent, these kinds of transitions can make us think and, and worry. Um, I was talking to one of my neighbours today about um, her son's transition into high school. So it'd be lovely to kind of hear what you're thinking about for yourself, because at the end of the day, we, yeah, we know how much of a weight can put on people, but we are here and, and this is what we're here to talk about this evening. So we're worried about doing the right things. Absolutely. Um, about the help that we'll be able to provide. And I think we'll talk through as well some, some ways in which can we kind of make sure that this, this isn't only support from you. We'll also be talking about um, social networks and how we can kind of build up these supports more broadly in advance to kind of make sure that this isn't just on your shoulders. Um, the deep unhappiness my daughter experiences to reach transition. It can be a difficult time. Um, we will talk through some techniques around that. Worried about failing. I think that's sometimes things that we always always kind of worry about, isn't it? In relation to our children, but it's it's a heavy feeling, I know. Getting into conflict with schools, I think it's um, we do play a big role as parents in engaging with institutions. Okay. Um, I hope it's also useful for you to be able to kind of see the worries of other parents around you. And the one of the reasons why we do this is that we know that it can feel quite lonely at times, sort of having this all on your shoulders. So this is another reason for kind of getting you to articulate some of this stuff. Okay. So um, if we jump right into some of the things that um, we can practically do. So, um, now research has shown that an individual's self esteem really strongly influences their interpersonal relationships and their ability to cope with situations. So, if we have low confidence, low self esteem, um, this can mean that we disengage from relationships, that we have troubles academically, that our mental health suffers. Whereas if we have a healthy self-esteem confidence, um, we tend to cope better with situations. Um, and that there's a positive and negative cycles of self-esteem, which we'll go through in a moment. Um, now, in addition, evidence would show that um, We, if we have a negative view of ourselves, and this tends to translate into a negative view of the world around us and also of our own future. So there are impacts to how our own feeling causes us to then interact with the world around us. Um, or if we can foster a positive self-image, then that can support a positive outlook. So um, another quick, um, Slido question, and I'm going to turn a light on so I'm not sitting in the dark. <laughs> can you see that? Yep, yeah, we can. We can see Slido. There we are, and, and we can see your kitchen wall as well. So there we go. <laughs> Sorry, it suddenly got incredibly dark. <laughs> so it'd be lovely to know um, 
if your young person is showing any of the following signs of low self-esteem or self-confidence. Um, and we'll see which of these sort of pop out up top. And we'll talk about why this is important at the moment. As we've, as we've said, sort of positive confidence can lead to a better ability to cope and vice versa. But we'll be talking about how we can support improve self-confidence. Okay, so we've got a lot of avoiding challenges and opportunities, isolating themselves. We, we speak to a lot of parents who are very worried about um, their young people isolating themselves sort of away in their bedrooms and not engaging, putting themselves down, absolutely kind of negative self-talk, rejection sensitivity and so forth. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, just that you're not only staring at the screen, you can see me. Um, so how can we foster positive self-image and self-confidence? Well, so the idea of positive self-concept and self-compassion have been found by the Wellcome Trust to be key protective factors in young people's mental health. So these are things that if we foster them can help protect young people against future mental health challenges. And these are things that we can kind of build pre-transition so we can help to build positive self-concept and self-compassion. So self-concept or self-evaluation is how young people compare themselves to others and how they reflect on how others view them and this in turn influences their perception of themselves. Um, positive self-evaluation is associated with better mental health outcomes while stigma can feed into negative self-evaluation. So if people are being told uh, by people around them, be it in their current environment, be it intentionally or unintentionally by friends, relatives, people in clubs, societies, that they are lazy or that they don't get it or they're being criticised in these ways, then it will really affect their own self-evaluation. Now, self-evaluation is much more flexible in the kind of 12 to 18 range than it is sort of beyond that stage. So this is something where if we can reinforce the positives about oneself then it can really help kind of balance off those negatives and, and make people genuinely feel so much more confident in themselves for the rest of their lives. Um, so research for autistic adults has shown that positive self-appraisals of their autistic characteristics and positive self-appraisals of their perceptions of the social support that they receive were related to higher self-esteem that felt like a lot of words coming out of my mouth. In short, if they felt more positive about their autistic qualities, and if they felt positive about the friendships and social support they had around them, then they felt better about themselves. They felt more confident, they got out, they did more. And these are all things that we can talk about how we can do that today. Um, next point was self-compassion. So self-compassion is, being kind and understanding towards ourselves and includes taking a balanced and self-supportive approach including in times of difficulty and recognizing that we're not alone in our suffering and that going through difficulties is a normal part of life. Now research has shown that higher self-compassion is associated with lower anxiety and depression. Um, so helping your young person be kind and compassionate towards themselves can create real benefits and what this means particularly in transitions is obviously you'll be taking on a whole load of new challenges and they are challenges but if we can help our young people be kind towards themselves avoid kind of negative self-appraisals be managed in just giving themselves credit for what they do and every single bit of energy they put into trying and you know really kind of putting that um effort into themselves then yeah, the more compassionate they'll be towards themselves, the better they'll feel. So um, what are some things that we can do to build self-confidence and self-compassion? I will show you a little slide. Is that on screen? I think I've shared the wrong one. That's the notion and it, it does work. We can see it, it's great. You can see it, okay. 
Um, so there are four things that you can do to build self-confidence. Um, you can encourage engagement in areas of interest and strength. Um, you can um, encourage people to engage in purposeful and impactful activities. I'm just going to stop sharing this because I don't think it's working very well. Um, you can listen and validate the views of your young person and you can also model positive self-esteem um, yourself. So number one, encourage engagement in areas of interest. So it may sound like a sort of obvious one. I mean, obviously we really appreciate um, our children, their strengths, the things that they do. Just sometimes we don't always dig into what those strengths mean or what they are in more detail. And sometimes we also don't necessarily dig into the areas of interest that our young people are interested in. Maybe it's just not something that's kind of in our sphere. Um, I know until very recently, I knew very little about various virtual worlds that existed, um, but having sort of dug into and asked um, young people to kind of take me through them, um, you know, it's really kind of clear the strengths that they have that shine in those spaces. So. I think when we're thinking about encouraging um, people to engage in their areas of interest and their strengths in those areas, um, we shouldn't be afraid to kind of enter into their worlds. It may sound like something that we've maybe been trying to do for ages and maybe do amazingly, um, but just sort of understanding this in a little bit more detail, really um, learning about exactly what they're doing and then being really positive about all of the kind of gains and experiencing the experiences they're having in those spaces will make a real difference. It might be that they're, they're building things in these spaces, they might be creating relationships, they might be innovating, they might be learning. And all of these things are things that we can, we can praise and encourage and really kind of help build self-esteem around. Um, secondly, purpose and impact. So um, it's, shown as another protective factor in mental health that if people engage in purposeful activities that have impact that they feel more confident and purposeful themselves so that means things like it could be volunteering social service environmental projects creative arts so basically anything that has an impact on the world that is tangible um is is kind of visible can help create change um, means that people can kind of see their impact on the world and they're less likely to have negative evaluations of themselves because they can see the positive impact they're having around them. We've had some lovely discussions with parents whose young people have taken on volunteering roles um, and those have also turned into the bedrock of future careers which they don't have to at all um, but there's lots of kind of other sort of positive things that come out of that. Thirdly, um, listen and validate your young person and keep them talking. We know that this isn't easy. We speak with a lot of parents who are very worried about uh, the amount of time the young person spells, spends in their bedroom and that they don't talk to them that much. As in, the young person won't necessarily talk to them that much. Um, but listen carefully. I think as I would say, tit tidbits may come out in small little increments. Um, and I think acknowledging every single, even micro concern that they have will, will validate their views. And it will mean that when bigger things come up through transitions, they're more likely to express those. Um, reserving judgment, I know we, none of us really mean to judge, but at times we will kind of imprint our own thoughts or feelings onto things that we hear. Um, so just be very open, kind of sometimes even just reflecting back to the person what they've said. Say, I hear you've just said this can be very validating without forming any frame or any advice around it just reflect it back to them um, and then just constantly kind of reassuring young people that their feelings are valid you know even if their reactions may seem extreme um, they still are their feelings and these are going to come up during transitions and so practicing this before transition is then much more likely to kind of keep this as a positive um, pattern during transition. Um, so fourthly, modeling positive self-esteem. Um, I'm sure we've all, all had those days when things don't quite go right and we can sort of say passively negative things about ourselves. Maybe we 
talk about not getting things right, getting things wrong. Oh, I failed to do that. I didn't do that. Oh, you know, we express um, negativity towards ourselves. And whilst we shouldn't let our children kind of think that life is super easy and everything's done without any energy or fuss, um, it's equally, it's, it's just important to articulate in a positive way how you handle disappointment. Because if you show your young person that something's happened, therefore you're going to reflect on it, take action, follow things through, see what you're gonna do different next time. Even maybe say about things you might do to make yourself feel better. Then these are all things that uh, young people can kind of pick up on, reflect, model. Um, and you know, praise yourself for trying if you've done something. Uh, praise yourself for, for not giving up or doing it again. You can also do this with your partner or with other close people to you. And all of this will just help young people kind of see this as a really kind of positive way of, of, of engaging and interacting. So I've talked for a long time, I realise, and I'm sure we want a nice little change. Shall I, sh shall I bring a nice little change? I think Sasha. Do you want to yeah. Okay, no problem. So listen, we're talking about chats at Keston. Thank you very much. We are talking about transitions. We're going to move it. We're going to transis, transis, tran anyway, transition into a new section now. But I would just like to take a little moment after um, as someone's been talking quite a lot. There's been quite a lot of information to come. It'd be quite nice to just kind of uh, take a moment to kind of process that. So I'd just like you to all just do a little bit of a shake and a little bit of wiggle in your seat as we move into a slightly different section. Try and just move your shoulders about a bit. If you can do that and just move them back again. And let's just get prepared for a little bit of interaction. Here we go. So we are talking about uh, how we can help you to support your young people. And one of the ways that we're going to talk about now is going to run a little exercise in uh, what we're calling a relationship stock take. So it's really important, as Kirsten has said, that um, young people, uh, that when it comes to times of transition, that we help to we think about transitions in kind of two or three different phases. The first is pre-transition. What can we do before a transition happens to remove uncertainty and to take away stress? And social, re social relationships and friendships are one of the greatest assets that young people have in help in removing this anxiety and this stress. But as Kirsten said, autistic people don't form friendships and social networks in this quite the same way as non-autistic people. So social structures can be slightly more complex to understand and to navigate. And a key thing that I was, I was absolutely unaware of, and Kirsten's got a lovely story that, about this, I'm gonna ask you to tell in a minute, Kirsten, if that's all right, is that some, it's quite frequent with people who are autistic to underestimate how much people care for them um, and, or how much people hold them in high esteem. So, and there's also, an, uh, uh, because it's coupled with a tendency to sort of slightly under communicate, it often means that autistic people find it harder to reach out and ask for help. So Kirsten, would you mind telling, that's the story you were talking about earlier, you had a really lovely example of this. You are on mute. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, so as I mentioned, I've went through a series of different transitions. I did my first year of uni. Um, it went okay, but I um, hadn't um, done written exams before and I really struggled in them um, and chose to basically stop, defer and come back. because I was also having some mental health challenges. And, you know, I'd had a pretty good year at uni in many ways. I'd made some friends, but I kind of walked away from uni and didn't really feel like I was taking friendships with me but I did pop back to see a, a friend there maybe three four months after I left and I was genuinely shocked and surprised in a really happy way at the number of people that came up to me in um just in and around the university to say hello and to say how they'd missed me and to ask how I was so people that I genuinely didn't really think knew me and as Sasha mentioned, this is just because I just don't interact socially as much as some other people do. I'm, I'm around, but my inclination will often just be to kind of stick my head down and I'm perfectly happy with it. 
um but it sometimes does mean you know I'm a bit sad I kind of feel that sometimes friendships haven't come my way but I think that example just really proved to me that actually sometimes I'm just not aware of the relationships around me also because I tend to think of as friendships as being those ones that are super close ones so that to me is a friendship is some, someone you could literally tell anything to whereas actually for non-autistic people friendships can go through a whole range of spectrum as they can for autistic people but um we, we tend to stick towards the more intense end at times um so yeah sometimes we're just we're just not aware of the networks that we have around us or we don't have that natural inclination to always reach out or we don't feel able to so Kirsten and I've been working together for a few months and I will absolutely reflect that um that is my experience of working with Kirsten I hope it's all right to say Kirsten that part of what I see my role is as Kirsten's co-founder is to help Kirsten to not help but to basically help well help Kirsten to realize that there is a whole bunch of people that she knows that actually like her very much and that this is like um something that I'm uh, I'm aware of with Kirsten so I try and find active ways of kind of encouraging or helping Kirsten to realize those things which I hope hope has been helpful to to some degree good good so um young people's but obviously social complexities and um there's that kind of the relationships that autistic young people have can can be very very complicated for all of those reasons and often are filled with negative experiences and a lot of young people that we've spoken to because we've we've interviewed and worked with many many young people have talked about those experiences being quite traumatic so as parents it's actually really necessary and as i know you guys know this you, you kind of have to work doubly hard to make sure that your child knows that there are people that love and care for them and actually want to help them and helping your child pre-transition stage to understand who they can call on for support what support that people that people can provide will absolutely help to manage those anxiety and encouraging them to reach out and ask for help from those people will be a really really will be a really really good thing and the thing that I have really noticed as well talking to lots of people who are lots of young people who are autistic is that it's really essential to reassure them that asking for help is not a failure because there's a tendency towards perfectionism and slight black and white thinking which we're going to be talking about in a minute but actually asking for help is just part of the human condition it's something that comes naturally to some of us and not to others and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it so it's really good to try when you're talking your child or your young person through these types of this type of approach to try and think about sort of examples of when someone might have helped them and how that made them feel and was that awkward and was that difficult or did it actually feel quite natural so I'm um, Kirsten would you mind just sharing the, the graphic the blue the next one the blue one so this is a graphic that is actually a really useful way of helping your young person to understand why having a support network is really important for their mental health um, no man is an island and of course when people are autistic actually having um, a few friends is better than having lots of friends and research shows that actually it's the quality not the quantity of friendships that um, uh, uh, can actually have a significant impact on mental health but the um, uh, I think the, we're having a slight problem with screen sharing Kirsten I don't know if you want to just come out and try and start it again um, it's not coming up let's just try again but certainly um, that tendency to kind of not reach out for help or that tendency to not want to um or to see it as failure um is something that you can explain to your to your young person so yeah it's still not working Kirsten for some reason um the screen share don't worry I can I can I can talk it through without it if you want to carry on just experimenting yeah we'll do it again okay so the first point is it's that it's important to have people that you can share with and open up to and that verbalizing those emotions is actually really really important particularly when autistic people uh, that's, not, that's something that autistic people particularly struggle with oh there you go we can see it now that's great um the second one is that it's important to have trusting relationships with people that you can rely on and that trust being absolutely key there the third is that it's it's important to regularly connect with family and friends because friendships are a two-way thing and it's really interesting we've noticed this um, pattern that has emerged with a few of the young people that we've spoken to where 
they quite often talk about this turning point in their life where they realize that they want to help other people and that other people want to help them. And that appear, that's a really interesting bit of research that keeps coming up and there. There just appears to be this kind of moment where there's this change of mindset. Um, and where we've noticed it happening is uh, when people transition from between school and university. Uh, it's just it's just an interesting thing, a sort of pattern that we've noticed. Um, fourth is that a mental health network can positively influence your your confidence. So if you have people who are uh, around you and reassuring you, that has a massive uh, positive impact on your mental health. And that you can also uh, reduce stress, anxiety and pressure. Um, obviously something that's incredibly important for uh, autistic young people. Um, six is that it's important to have someone who listens to your needs. And I think that's something that um, autistic young people often struggle with as Kirsten's talk about is communicating um, what they need and that the person who mentioned before about someone, their daughter who was advocating for herself, brilliant, it sounds like you've got that covered. Um, seven, that it will use, it will help to maintain positive relationships for the future and so that helping your young person to understand that friendships and um, relationships are something that kind of build up over time, it's not just sort of something that happens immediately. Eight, that it's because it will keep you active, social and connected um, and obviously loneliness again when we've spoken to young people who are transitioning out of school into university or college, lo loneliness is something that they really really worry about. Uh, nine, because it's important to have the right people to support you, the, the emphasis there being on right um, and that sometimes negotiating those sort of social networks can be difficult and if people are particularly vulnerable they may end up working, you know, becoming friends with people that are not necessarily good for them so helping them to understand that it's the right people need to be there to support you and that a mental health can help you to solve problems that you're facing and that's certainly something that um, we know that the autistic people that we've spoken to and done research with have really valued about the kind of friendships that they've made. So Kirsten, could I ask you to come out of that slide? Um, and we're going to ask you another question here, um, which is um, uh, what benefits do you think your young person would most gain from a support network? So I could ask you just to go into slider there and to have a little vote on some of those things so what benefits do you think your young person would gain most from having a support network when it comes to transitions let's see if we start getting some answers some answers through there brilliant so building positive relationships for the future fantastic having people they can trust and rely on brilliant Positively influencing their confidence, that's coming up, that's great. Okay, getting a few more people through here. Yeah, great. So it looks like the, yeah, reducing stress and anxiety. So Kirsten and I are super aware that anxiety and stress is a really, really common issue for people who are neurodi di neurodivergent. Um, and in fact, it, that informs a lot of the products that we're designing at the moment. Brilliant. That's great. So it looks like the highest there is reducing stress and anxiety. Well, I, I will let you know that that does come out every time we do this. We do a, a, a poll like this. Stress and anxiety always comes out first. So uh, that's helpful to know. So we're going to do a little exercise now. Now, I'm, we get, this, is, this isn't a bit of an experiment. Uh, we've not done this before. So you're part of a live experiment. Kirsten, could I just ask you to come off that slide for the moment? Um, and we're just going to go on to um the gallery view um so if you could stop screen sharing that would be great no don't worry it's fine we go so we're going to run through an exercise now which uses a very clear and systematic approach to approach to help your child to understand who might be able to support them and what type of support that person can give and this is called support network mapping so the point of this exercise is to help your young person to understand that different types of people can offer different types of support and it's a very logical and clear way of being able to do that so in order to do this i need a volunteer so is there anyone here who might be happy to switch their cameras on and would be happy to work through this exercise for me for about three or four minutes in order to do it what you need to feel comfortable telling me about is a kind of uh, your network of friends and family and be happy to name them and talk about what you like and value about them. So would anybody be happy to volunteer? If you are, just stick your camera on and give me a little wave. Uh, Hannah Walker, yes, let's do it. Great, Hannah, can you put your camera on? Let's see if we can see you, are you there? 
yeah oh i don't know have you switched your camera on Hannah? oh yes you're coming on now fabulous hi great sorry. hello <laughs> hi nice to see you thanks for doing this all right so Kirsten and I have not done this before. We're not entirely sure how it's going to work, but let's let's have a go. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, Kirsten is going to type is going to share screen is going to type live as you're talking, okay. and we're going to have a go at live doing one of this these um, support network maps. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions about your family and friends, yeah. and then Kirsten's going to type as we are my family or friends or my about. Young about your we're going to do it with you because it's a little okay. bit easier if that's all right yep so um the first question i would like to ask you is, is your name's hannah isn't it yeah. that's right so we could put your name in the middle kirsten that would be great and what i would like you to do is to think about the types of people you have in your life that kind of support you or could support you at the moment so uh i'm going to start you off by saying uh family so is there someone in your family that you think particularly supports you? Yeah, my sister Gemma. Your sister Gemma. All right, brilliant. So Kirsten, if in one of those uh, bubbles you could put uh, Gemma and type family, that would be great. Um, brilliant. So the category we're looking at here is family. It's your sister Gemma. And could you tell us, Hannah, could you just give us kind of a very quick sort of one thing that your sister does for you that is really, really phenomenal? Well, one thing. Um... Yeah, just one. Yeah, just a, or one good thing about your sister. She would always answer the phone if I rang. Amazing. She, you know, she knows that I need her. Yeah, brilliant. So she's always she's always on the end of the phone. Yeah. Brilliant. OK. And would you say if you saw if you see those tags in the left hand corner where it says emotional, tangible, informational, social, if you were to say the type of support she was there for, which one of those would you choose? Um, emotional emotion brilliant so your sister Gemma she's always available on the end of the phone and she gives you emotional support fabulous okay so if I was to ask about let's say another category might be friends yeah yep great could you give me an example a name of a uh, a friend of yours that uh you wouldn't mind talking us talking to us about um Gosh. Don't worry. Or yeah. does it doesn't even have to be a um, close friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my friend Zara. Zara, did you say? Yeah, with a Z, with an S. Sorry. Yeah. Not that sorry. it matters. Yeah, no, it's fine. And what type of what type of support does Zara give you? Is she emotional? Is it tangible? And tangible meanings that she she's someone that would give you practical help with something. Um, is it informational or social? Um, I'd I'd say social. Okay. Brilliant. And could you give us one thing? Just us two. Like we we would yeah. go out for a walk for three hours with each other. Just oh amazing. Uh, nonsense. No sort yeah. of yeah. Brilliant. So she gives you kind of social support. Fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you work? I do. Anna, you do brilliant. Is that could we put colleagues in as a category as well? Would that yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah, great. OK, so could you give an example of a colleague at work that gives you well, a bit? It's a little bit more difficult because I run my own business. <laughs> okay, right. Well, what about someone it's all, or like, is there like a partner you work with? or? But a there's, um, I, I do have a very good network of other, I'm a photographer, other photographers. Yep. Um, and I, I would say um, Laura Babb, who is... Uh, an autistic friend of mine yeah. um so yeah we have we we talk probably maybe not daily but a couple of times oh so nice okay yeah. and what, what what type of support does Laurie give you um those four categories feel emotional or emotional and what what did you say? describe tangible to me again? So ta tangible is like practical help like the person yep. who might lend, lend you a camera if yours broke down or uh would, would drive you somewhere if your car broke down or something like that um okay and um, informational was informational would be the person who helps you who gives you information about stuff you don't know so an example of someone who might do that might might actually be a doctor or a teacher or something I would say she's informational and emotional. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so she's kind of a fount of knowledge. She is, yeah. yeah and also emotional, brilliant. So, um, and what, and what could you just give? Uh, just say one nice, sort of one nice thing about her that she's that she's done for you, or that you like about her. 
and we leave we leave whatsapp voice notes to each other if we don't have time to speak to each other yeah um, it's given me quite a lot of support during my daughter's diagnosis as well yeah okay amazing um, yeah so it's sometimes work related sometimes personal she's yeah yeah brilliant okay that's that's great let's um let's come off screen there but as you can see thank you very much Hannah that's that that's fabulous but can can you can, Hannah can I actually I'm going to I'm going to keep you on screen if that's okay. if that's all right um can you see what we're doing here in terms of mm. trying to categorize what type of people give what type of support yeah yeah um, yes. and I think when it comes to young people and your child or anybody's child actually this type of categories might be a little bit wider so for example things that might also come under this category would be uh trusted adults coaches a teacher a doctor maybe a carer or a support worker so what we're trying to do here Kirsten if you could would you mind coming off um share screen now Thank you. What we're trying to do here is give a practical way that potentially you could sit down with your child yeah. and say what different types of people can give you what types of support. And it's a very, very logical it's a really way. good exercise, actually, because I think that would really help my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly I think in that stuff that Kirsten's talking about, but understanding the nature of what different friendships and relationships mean, it can be a very yeah. clear way. And to, to kind of help with that brilliant okay um so um there's I'm just slightly aware of time Kirsten so I'm probably just going to skip the next bit but um which is I would have Hannah if you had some time asked you a few more questions on this but I'm not going to at the moment but what I will say to all of you is that all of these resources we're going to share after the presentation so this example of this map and some other questions that we might ask are all going to be available after the after this after this presentation so brilliant Hannah if you could go back to, to turn your turn your your camera off brilliant and thank you very much well done for, for putting your hand up and um and uh, and volunteering there so this this is this is this is a really really helpful exercise um where you might take this after you've done this is that once you've done this mapping is that you might ask your child to make a list of everything that they are worried about with their transition and then plot which people might be able to help with those worries. So if your child is worried about, for example, being lonely at university or college, you can help them to say, right, well, which of your support network or the people who are around you can help you to prevent you from feeling lonely? So for example, if they're going to university and saying, and leaving some of their friends behind, actively approaching those friends before they go to university and saying, can we still stay in contact? Can we meet up in the holidays? Can I WhatsApp you from time to time? Can be really, really helpful because it can help the your autistic young person just to feel confident there's a group of people around that are going to support them. And this is not something as Kirsten has has explained that actually comes particularly particularly naturally. Okay, so that will be in the resources that we've um, we've sent earlier. But we've got another quick poll that we'd like to do here, if that's okay. Um, and uh, Kirsten, if you wouldn't mind just put going into Slido. And the question we'd like to ask you is, what additional support do you think you will need in addition to the network that you can build? So what additional supports do you think you will need in addition to the network? So if you could all have a little answer of that, that would be super. So this is about your young people. So what additional supports do you think your young people might need? Your, your child might need in addition to the support network that you can help them to build. So we've got here helping cheering up in difficult times or asking someone for advice, challenging them to think differently, help with honest feedback. What other, brilliant. So, okay, helping problem solving, brilliant. Yeah, of course. And that again is problem solving is something that does come up with the young people that we speak to. Help when feeling worried and anxious. Yep, so we know that anxieties and worries are coming up there. Okay, brilliant. These are going to just scroll up to the top. So help and so anxiety absolutely coming out of the top, which is again no surprise because it very very frequently comes at the top. Okay, I'm going to ask you to close that poll now, Kirsten, and go back um, to gallery to gallery view. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is so that that's one example of a practical exercise that you can do, and that is about building positive relationships and goes back to that framework, which informs absolutely everything that Kirsten and I do together. The second we're going to talk about is positive and negative cycles of self-esteem. Um, Kirsten, would you be happy to talk a little bit um, 
uh, just to take this little bit now, is that all right? Absolutely. <clears throat> so um, we talked up front about the importance of self-confidence and self-esteem. And one of the things that can happen, so if, if things are going well, we're getting great feedback, we feel better about ourselves, we feel more confident about taking on new challenges, and there's this great positive cycle up and up and up um, of our self-esteem and our ability to deal with the world. Or conversely, if we are getting what we perceive to be negative inputs, then we can go into negative thinking cycles. So um, what you can do as parents um, when you're starting to go through this transition, or even before, if, if there's sort of anticipation, is really be on the lookout for these negative thinking cycles and negative self-talk. Now, as autistic people, we are often really quick thinkers. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, when we're in uncertain and new situations, um, because there's a lot going on, um, our quick thinking can mean that we often default quite quickly to snap decisions, decisions around what's right or wrong, good or bad, positive or negative. Um, and so that black and white thinking can become a bit of a default. Um, so if we haven't done something 100% perfectly, or if we haven't re received really explicit affirmation of um, a hint towards friendship or that we've succeeded at something, then often we assume that we've got it wrong, um, that we've failed, that something is not a possibility. And this can lead to really detrimental cycles of self-criticism and low self-esteem and eventually sort of disengagement as we um, withdraw. So as a parent, one of the things that we can do is to try and kind of watch for these hints, even kind of the early signs of negative self-talk, negative commentary about even the tiniest of instances. And we can sort of help to unpack some of the stuff. And by unpacking the truth behind this, we can try and basically break the cycle. So stop um, these small little negative reactions turning into ongoing cycles of negative thinking and action. So Sasha, maybe you can kind of talk us through, it, us through this in a bit more detail. Yeah, so what we're going to, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an example of um, some negative thought patterns. So, um, Kirsten, would you be able to pop that slide up, the, the um, low self-esteem and high self-esteem cycles? So here, th these two cycles here that Kirsten's going to show you now are, uh, talk to, show you how these things are kind of cyclical and how they feed into each other. And I'm going to give you a, a, a practical example of what a low self-esteem cycle might look like and therefore might be able to help you to spot it. So your... Um, is it not your screen share to come again? Um, yeah, brilliant. So if you just move on to the next slide, that'd be super. Uh, great. So as you can see there, this is a low self-esteem cycle and a high self-esteem cycle. So um, here is an example of what might look like a low self-esteem cycle. So your child comes to you, a young person comes to you and tells you that they don't have any friends and they feel really lonely. So an example of a, how this might work with a negative self-esteem cycle is this. I tried talking to people, but nobody understands me. So what's the point of trying? This then leads your young person to start to withdraw socially. And I'm sure a number of you have experienced this. This then goes to the, this then reinforces the point about them not having any friends. So they don't think they've got any friends. This leads to them withdrawing socially and therefore it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. This starts to impact their relationship with their family and friends and has an impact on their self-esteem. The impact on their self-esteem goes back to negative self-talking, which is I don't have any friends. So this cycle just keeps on going and keeps on going. And what, as a parent, we need to do is to try and get our young person into the high self-esteem cycle. Uh, and it's not easy, 
Um, but there's a technique that you can use called the seesaw technique, which I'm going to demonstrate to you now. So if you could come off that um, screen, uh, Preston, that'd be great. So this is the seesaw technique. Now, obviously, the point of a seesaw is that it balances. It, it, well, it try, sometimes it balances, sometimes it doesn't. But we accept that these things are sometimes a little bit wobbly. And any time your young person is going through a transition, there is always going to be a wobbly period. And what this exercise does, it kind of helps to reframe some of that negative thought processes and starts to help your young person to think about what some more positive aspects of that might be. So it's a really effective way of helping you to see a more balanced view of a situation. It can help you identify the specifics of that situation as opposed to just thinking about it in sort of black and white terms. Um, and it's really about just reframing it. So let's stay with that same example I gave earlier, which was, I try talking to people, but nobody understands me. So what's the point of even trying? So what the seesaw approach does is it asks you to balance every specific negative with a specific positive. So this is something you can try with your young person at home. So, for example, your young person says, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to talk to people, but nobody understands me. What's the point of trying? What you might say to them is actually, is it true that nobody understands you? Is it true that you have no friends and ask your young person that and then ask them to maybe think about an example of when someone had been nice to them so you're starting to tip that seesaw so your young person might end up saying do you know what my classmate Sophie really helped me the other day so you're starting to tip that back and that can you can then go back and say but that is an example of someone being friendly to you and someone being kind to you do you think that person might be your friend so can you see that what we're trying to do there is just to break that cycle of saying, this is your young person coming with a very, very extreme black and white, nobody likes me, I can't make any friends. And you're coming back with specific positive questions and examples to help them kind of just reframe what that might mean. So we're gonna ask you one more question. And then we're gonna go, we're gonna go quickly to ask, uh, after we've done this, we're gonna go quickly to Cathy to see if cathy has got any advice in the guidance. Cathy's a fount of all knowledge. And then we'll move to questions and answers. So the last question we would like to ask you is what type of negative thinking traps does your young person tend to fall into? So, um, and just so you know, the reason we're asking you all these questions is that we, Kirsten and I fundamentally believe that we need to be designing products that work for people. And we're asking you all these questions because these, this is the type of information that is going to help us design products that we believe are actually going to be effective as opposed to just assuming that we know what the answers are. So we've got a few answers coming in now. So uh, what negative thinking traps does your young person tend to fall into? I have no friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no point in trying because I'll just fail anyway. Catastrophizing. Constantly presuming the worst and always putting herself down. That I'm not perfect and that certain teachers don't like her. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, so there's some really, really good examples there. So I think if we took the example of saying, um, that uh, nobody understands them. That's a common one that we hear coming up time and time again that Kirsten have heard in our research. So if you were to take the seesaw approach to that, what you might say, okay, so you think nobody understands you, but let's just have a think back to the last couple of weeks. And can you give an example of when actually that might not have been true? So you're just constantly trying to sort of balance those things out. Brilliant. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, OK, so hopefully that's given you a couple of ways that you can kind of start to break those cycles. Um, Kirsten, would you be able to come off share screen now? And that's the end of what we are. That's kind of that, that's that's the end of the main part. And Kathy, I wonder we might move to hello. <laughs> we might move to you. So Kathy is obviously the fount of all wisdom and knowledge when it comes to everything like that. And Kathy. <laughs> We've no Kathy, pressure then. <laughs> no pressure, exactly. Sorry, that's been quite a build up there. Um, Kathy, I wondered if you would you be happy just to do a few minutes on kind of um, a lot of the people obviously in the room have, have talked about the transition from primary to secondary and then from secondary up till uh, up to university. And I know that you've kind of got a lot of a lot of it sort of lived experience and also just from the community about anything practical that, that people might yeah, find. Sure. <laughs> so, um, so last year. Um, as part of my master's, I did a research paper on transition from primary to secondary school, and we wrote it up as an autistic girls network study. And that's I'll put the link in. Uh, there's a blog on it on our website, and I'll put the link in the chat afterwards. Um, but we so we looked at um, 
what autistic pupils found difficult about school transition but what was what was probably the most interesting thing to come out of that research um, was that we had 17 um, families take part um, and of those 17 only three of them had a good transition <laughs> terrible isn't it but that that's the case um, and of those three we expected or maybe just I expected that all of those young people would have been diagnosed at primary school but that wasn't the case there was one of those three was not diagnosed autistic until after um, she moved to secondary school because it was a girl I think um, and I presume that she was on the same register um, so there was knowledge uh, because um, all three of those that had a good transition, um, it worked well because it was a really, really well-planned, um, totally personalised and individualised transition plan. It wasn't the same as everybody else. Uh, it involved a lot more coming to the new school, meeting the teachers that they were going to um, be with, meeting a TA if, you know, if they had um a TA involved with them and all those things like that it was very very bespoke to them and that was the secret to a good transition now of course if your child or young person has been completely unrecognized as autistic at primary school as indeed my daughter was you're not going to be able to have that that that's not going to be possible because they're not on the send register um, they're not on anyone's radar as needing extra support so that's why at autistic girls network we are fanatical you might say about trying to get people diagnosed earlier or at least recognized earlier but a lot of the things that uh, people found difficult at secondary school coming from primary school aren't going to be any surprise to any of you so things like moving from a small school to a much larger school corridor corridors of hell between classes where you're bumping into other pupils um, the dining halls were a particular problem um, indeed my daughter didn't eat at school for about 18 months um, the unstructured time and I, I'm actually doing work on the autism in schools pilot um, in my area at the moment and what's coming up um, in our meetings with parents particularly is that parents are worried about the unstructured time but all they're hearing about or the only communication they're getting from school is about academic stuff and they're actually much more concerned about what's happening at break and lunch and after school does their child have friends are they struggling are they being bullied that's what they want to have communication about um, so that's really something that schools need to be aware of um, of course many teachers instead of one class teacher that's a huge transition to make loads more people that you don't know um, unpredictable class subjects like science or dt or pe where pupils are moving around and you can't predict what's going to happen um, much more independent working expected uh, and perhaps unless you've got um, significant support written into an ehcp um, perhaps not very much help with executive function difficulties and also possibly the loss of your peer network from your previous school. Um, what we did find was that pupils who moved up with quite a lot of friends such as my daughter um, because she moved from a feeder school uh, half her class but went to her new school and she was put into a class with two of her best friends um, and we did some research, um, it was probably three years ago now, actually, we probably need to run it again. And we found that the most difficult time um, that parents said that their young people had broken, really, um, was the February half term of year seven. Um, for my daughter, it was a little bit later. And I think I have talked to, with her about it since. And we think that she was very much cushioned by her friendships, by her peer relationships. Um, and another really important thing for autistic pupils is having a teacher who understands them, or at least an adult, could be a TA, could be anyone, could be 
a lunchtime supervisor, but having somebody that really understands them at school was very important. And what we found were the elements of a good transition or what might make a good transition more likely um, was, first of all, that it's a process that needs to start well ahead of September. Um, you know, possibly needs to start, needs to have already started now um, for transition for this year. And that also that it continues through the whole of year seven. So it's not transition, you've moved to school, that's it. For an autistic pupil, you're going to be transitioning through that whole year and you're going to be having new experiences through that whole year of year seven. Um, obviously, support plans should be very individualised and based on needs. Um, the autistic person needs to become as familiar as they possibly can with their new school and teachers. And obviously, this is relevant for all transitions, not just transition to secondary. In fact, my daughter's now going through transition to college and that is very much written into her EHCP um, that she has a very very bespoke and um, significant transition plan if you like so I will expect the college to allow her to go quite a lot of times between GCSEs and the end of the year um, so that she can really understand where she is and picture how she's going to get from classroom to classroom etc. I think a low sensory arousal environment is really important. However, <laughs> although I say it's important, it's not likely to happen in most mainstream secondary schools, let's face it. Uh, but at least if schools are more understanding of, of how environments can trigger sensory overwhelm, that's a, that's a start. Um, and given that year seven is often the year where autistic masking breaks down and pupils go into crisis, teachers really need to be aware of signs um, of, of, that is, of what is happening there, signs of crisis, but also signs before crisis, sign, how to recognise an internal presentation of autism. Um, and if anyone hasn't had a look at our white paper, um, you can find that on our website and that will, that will really give you an idea of how to recognise that. And there's all kinds of things that schools can do or colleges um, can do to help with that. So they can do things like having um, a colour coded map of the school in advance so that someone who has a better brain than me at finding their way around a map can learn how to get from classroom to classroom um, without actually being there. Um, a visual timetable, pictures of teachers, pictures of entrances that they might be coming into, videos, et cetera, of people getting lunch, how you get lunch, what is the process for it? All of those things will help with press preparation and preparation will help with anxiety. Um, they can run some schools or activity clubs uh, before starting school. They can set up a buddy system um, with older pupils, but it needs to be well supervised to make sure there's no bullying. Uh, they can send photos and make a little scrapbook beforehand. And often it's nice if older pupils actually do this. Um, they can have a key worker for visits. Um, we have heard of schools who've set up a visit to the dining hall to eat lunch with a support group prior to starting. Although I hope that it was a visit when everyone else wasn't in the dining hall, because otherwise it'd be a bit of a nightmare. Um, set, they've set up support groups met the Senko in advance and learned about the chill out spaces, hoping that there are some. Um, support with break time, interesting clubs to facilitate social mixing. And by interesting, I mean, not just sports clubs, but more interesting stuff like maybe Pokemon or Lego or um, Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, anything. anything. Or urban urban infrastructure if it was urban infrastructure is probably slightly less likely but you never know never say never so those are all the things um that can help and you know as parents we don't necessarily have control over these things but if your child or your young person has an ehc plan then these are things that you can get written into the plan so um i think the most important thing is that this needs to be prepared well in advance. And if, you're, um, if your child is going to college, then this should have been being prepared for 
in the EHC and in the annual reviews from the age of 14. So it shouldn't be a surprise, uh, although it often is. Thank you, Cathy. That was amazing. I'm not wrong that you're the fount of all knowledge. See? <laughs> Um, so we've had a few questions come in since we're, while you were talking, um, so I'm just going to pop into those. Um, and I wonder whether Kirsten and Kathy, you're happy to answer those between you, if that's if, if that kind of if that kind of works. So the first question we've got here is from Degna Stone, who says, "Any advice on not being able to eat at school due to sensory overload?" Well, I mean, I would say don't worry too much about it. Um, Obviously, the school needs to make reasonable adjustments. So, and that, and use that phrase, that is a legal phrase. Under the Equality Act 2010, they have an obligation to make reasonable adjustments about all kinds of things, but food would certainly come under that. And so they need to provide somewhere else that your young person would be happy to eat, somewhere they can't hear everybody else eating and they can't smell the dreadful smells of school food, et cetera. Um, However, that might not work. Um, and you, you might be in a situation where your young person won't eat at school. And um, in, I got around it by making sure that she had breakfast and I had food available when I picked her up from school in the car. Instantly, she could have food. That's not gonna work for everybody. Um, but you know, you're gonna need to play it by ear, but do your best to get school to, to make reasonable adjustments. Brilliant, thank you, Cathy. Um, Kirsten, there's one here from Sarah who says, any advice for an autistic mum parenting an autistic girl? I've only just realised I'm probably autistic at the age of 40. Gosh, that's increasingly common, isn't it? And find it hard supporting my daughter as all the things she finds hard, I, I also used to struggle with and still do. I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this is definitely where social networks come in. Um, I absolutely know that I am not the best person to advise uh, my own daughter on various things. Um, and I, I, I don't actually feel too bad about that, to be honest. Um, I'm sort of lucky in the sense that I am self-identified 20 years ago and was kind of pre-diagnosed then, but only did formal diagnosis about a year ago. Um, so I've sort of known or had that feeling for quite that, that I'm autistic for quite a long time but um we have a, a lovely colleague that we work with from time to time who when she realized um that she was not going to be able to support her daughters the way that she wanted to she very scientifically sat down and did a network mapping exercise genuinely a bit like what we've done and um chose six people who between them um, she felt we're going to be able to support her daughters in very different ways, talk to them all, um, talk to her daughters about that as well. And, and it works really well. And I'd say I definitely, I definitely do that. I mean, none of us are experts at everything. Um, the only challenge is obviously sort of finding good solutions that work, um, that works for your daughter. So there is also a bit of kind of doing research, reaching out, sort of asking in kind of the community, the autistic community about what works in certain situations. That's also really helpful. Um, but yeah, I think when, especially when it comes to kind of navigating um, social relationships, it's something that I still ask for advice on a lot of the time, as Sasha knows, as my friends know. Um, and, and it's one of the things that, that helps both me, both not just get by, but actually succeed because I, I do, misunderstand a, a lot of things still and I know that so I just know that I have to sense check um but yes I think social support networks and reaching out into the community with my best thing and then just just self-compassion <laughs> be kind to yourself it's fine no one person can do everything it'll be okay you're amazing I'm sure also reframe it a little bit because your child, your young person knowing that you went through the same thing mm -hmm. is very valuable to them. So it's not, you know, yeah. it's not a bad thing. And you can always ask in the Autistic Girls Network Facebook group. There's 10,000 people in there now who can help you. It's an amazing group. Get through it. <laughs> it's so good. Um, we, I'm just aware slightly of time to so do a couple more questions before we get to the end. So um, Kirsten, this is interesting. Um, my, my daughter is asking if not wanting to make friends in college is a bad thing. It's a really, 
It's a really interesting one. And I read it and then sort of reread it just to check that I'd understood it. Um, look, I can, I have to say I can empathize with this for, for a couple of different reasons. Um, making new friends can be really challenging. I personally find it a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Um, I do find it stressful and worrying at times. Um, but then when you find amazing people, it's just amazing. And I think the interesting thing about going to college is because you have more freedom and a greater breadth and variety of people than you may have experienced at school, actually there's many more opportunities to find more people either like you, directly like you, or with other kind of qualities that really appeal to you. And I think it's something that's hard for young people to understand because obviously they, they haven't been through that process of getting gradually more out and out into the world. Um, but it, but it's very, it's very real. So I, mean, I think, um, no, it's, it's not a bad thing having that feeling of not, not wanting to. Um, in part, it's, it's fear, it's worry, or this just instinctive feeling that you just don't want, don't want to. And I think, I think that's okay. But I think, um, if it feels right, you know, definitely maybe kind of talk through what's inside that not wanting to. If she's already got a great network of friends, that's great. But if it is down to that fear and anxiety, one thing I would say is that it's, there are definitely times when I've looked back on situations and I haven't tried to make friends because I have felt that fear. And then I've kind of regretted after the event, not trying. Um, but none of that trying has, should ever be at the expense of that person's well-being. Um, so I think it's a, it's a careful balance. So I think validating that fe those feelings, if it's possible, digging into it a little bit, you know, reassuring about the options. But at the end of the day, it it's okay to have one or two close friends in life and and be like that. It really is about the quality of relationships, not not. I think we might have. Okay, so e either I cut out there, Kirsten, or you did. I'm not sure. One of one of the two of us. But I, um, I'm, I, I'm. So I'm aware that we're now at nine thirty, and so we are probably don't want to keep people for too long. Um, so I'm just going to say right at the end, which is a little bit of a plug for Uncommon. If you'd like to go to our website, which is Uncommon Minds co.uk you can sign up to our mailing list we would absolutely love to have as many of you on our mailing list as possible we're also going to be running a few um sort of tests over the next few weeks and we would love as many of your young people to be involved with those tests as possible kirsten and i are designing products at the rate of knots at the moment and we need loads and loads of young people to help us test them and experiment and tell us what they like and what they don't like so please please do sign up and also get your young people to sign up to our um, our mailing list as well yeah so we're just going to pop on screen um, a little place where you can leave your emails for us if you would like um, to stay in touch um, if you leave us your email, we'll share a copy of the notes and all the diagrams and everything from the session. Um, and you can also go to our website and basically find out, you know, sign up to test products and things with us. It is an opportunity for people to also kind of see inside product design if they like kind of UX, if they like digital stuff, you know. Um, and we do also run a youth panel of a small group of young people that work with us continuously to help evolve these things and it's it's a great it's great work experience and great to have on your cv as well so if that's of interest is the that. is that link in the in the, are you popping that link in the chat right yeah. brilliant because a few people are popping email addresses in so we will um i'm just going to very quickly um so as Kirsten does that, then if you could just use that link to pop you, put your email addresses in. And as I say, we'd love to keep in contact with you. There you are, Jenny. I can see you've gone to our website and filled in the form. Thank you very much. They're all starting to pop through now. So much appreciated. But it's been it's been absolutely brilliant to um, talk to you all today. And thank you very much for for um, for being here. And Kathy, thank you for inviting us. You're very welcome. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Sasha and Kirsten. Um, and I will let everybody know we are supposed to be having another 
session with Autistic Doctors International um, next week, but they haven't actually got back to me to confirm. So I'm not sure if that's going ahead or not. But anyway, we, we are meant to be having two events in May. Um, so either that will be two or it will just be one. <laughs> but anyway, we will continue to have events and uh, please continue to sign up and come to them um, because it makes them more fun. So thanks everybody tonight and I hope you all um, have a pleasant rest of the evening. Thank you. I'm just checking whether Kirsten's managed to pop that link in. Have you? Oh, have you is it not um, in there yet? Thank you. Bye bye. Is it, is it on share screen? Uh, no. No. Uh, there you go. Oh, it's on Slido. Okay, so quick, a quick another Slido for everyone. If you just quickly go into Slido and pop the um, and pop your details in there um, or in our website which is uh, www.uncommonminds.co.uk. So the final slide of the night. <laughs> so stick, a, stick an email in and we'll be in touch. And to the person who asked about what to do over the summer holidays, I would really recommend all sorts of volunteering research. There's all sorts of organizations out there that can help um, lots of fun structured summer stuff. I'd have to say all of my summers were basically structured. Um, which is all stuff that I went and researched generally and did and did myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Fun. Definitely some kind fun. of structure. Definitely good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. So much. Yes. Bye. You. Bye. Kathy, would you would you mind if I just quickly grabbed you after this? Is that all right? Just, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs>